first, I want to give you the opportunity to ask questions that may have appeared in the meantime, and then I'll give you um, a quick recap of what we went through last time. So first, the questions. Any questions that you have immediately? Yes. No, there will be um, a certain dose of uh, Blackboard um, beginning today. So there are just going to be three slides on variational base, and the, um, the rest is going to be on the Blackboard, yes. Were you longing for the Blackboard to play a role? Or um, OK, good, good. So you'll, um, you'll get something in that department today. Other questions? Yes? When I mean model, no. Um, a model is something more specific than a probability distribution. Yes, please don't forget to sign the attendance sheet. Yeah. Um, a probability distribution is um, simply a positive function that integrates to one. And um, if you have a model, you need a likelihood, which is basically a model of how you make observations. And you need a prior on the parameters <laughs> governing the um, observations, then you can continue this hierarchically. You can have priors on your priors, which are hyper priors, and then you can have priors on your hyper priors, and so on. So that's how you build a hierarchical model. But a model is more than just a probability distribution. So um, as we saw last time, you need two components of your model, the likelihood and um, the Prior, where do we have this? Here. So, and if you combine likelihood and prior, you have your full generative model. So that's what you um, need to generate your model. And this is also the joint probability distribution over your observations and parameters. So one way you can put it is your model is your joint probability distribution over observations and parameters. So it's a special kind of probability distribution, a very specific kind. What would I say about the model? So the model is the joint probability distribution over your observations and your parameters. And you can decompose this into the likelihood, which is basically your observations conditioned on the parameters or hidden states of your environment, times the prior on your hidden states or parameters. The difference between hidden states and parameters is simply that parameters are constant, while hidden states change with time. And if you have a model that um, looks at time series, then states are going to change from time to time to time and so on, whereas your parameters stay constant. Was that what you were getting at with the question? No. Good. Further questions? OK, good. So this is a good point to start. The quick recap of last time. This is the basic way we do Bayesian inference. We use Bayes' theorem to go from one conditional um, probability P of A given B to the reverse P of B given A. That's what Bayes' theorem does for you. And all you need for this is the um, rules of probability theory. And it is what people do when they run experiments. They have a model of the system they're modeling. In this example, the brain. They have observations they make on the brain. 
in this case, EEG or MRI measurement, and they have a model of how the states of the brain will produce measurements. And on the basis of that model, you can infer back onto what the state of the brain was as you were doing your measurements. And the same thing applies to how the brain itself, or if you want to build a robot that uh, works like a brain, how that robot would operate in relation to the outside world. You need to have a model of that outside world in order to navigate it successfully. So you infer the state of the world, you solve the inverse problem on the basis of the model you have of the outside world, of what states the outside world will evoke in you via your sensory input. Then we saw this. Every good regulator of a system must be a model of that system. So there's no way around having a model, or even in some sense being a model, of the environment you're trying to manage, to regulate. So this raises the question, how do we update beliefs? How does the brain do that? And uh, Bayesian inference is the optimal way to do that because Bayesian inference does not throw information away. That's the key feature of Bayesian inference. If you do inference in any other way, you, that amounts to it is the same as throwing part of the information that you have away. If you do Bayesian inference, you take account of everything you know. So not doing Bayesian inference is in some way illogical, irrational. The problem is that Bayesian inference is very complicated, and there can be a very high computational burden. So we need to use approximations when we do it, and when a biological system like the brain does it, it will also have to resort to some sort of approximation, because if it tries to do everything exactly, it'll take it longer than it takes its adversaries to eat it to finish the calculation. So organisms that take too long calculating their posteriors, they're uh, not going to be around for very long. So we looked at updates in a simple Gaussian model. So we had a Gaussian prime a Gaussian likelihood, and this gives us, by Bayes' theorem, a Gaussian posterior. And the interesting thing, then, is how do we pass from the sufficient statistics of the prior and the likelihood to the new sufficient statistics of our posterior? So we talked a bit about sufficient statistics, or there was a question in... Uh, during the break, sufficient statistics are simply um, the parameters that fully describe your probability distribution. So if you have a parametric distribution, a distribution that can be described using a few parameters and then you have that full distribution, then these few parameters that you can use to describe that distribution are sufficient statistics. So, for instance, if you have a very simple Bernoulli distribution, like in a coin toss, then you only need one parameter. You can only have one sufficient statistic. If you have a fair coin, the parameter is going to be 0.5, because it's equally likely to get heads or tails. If you don't have a fair coin, your parameter may be 0.6, representing the probability of 60% of getting heads. If you have a Gaussian distribution, you need two sufficient statistics. You need the mean and the variance. So here, we're not working in terms of variance. We're working in terms of precision, which is the inverse of the variance, because that gives us a simpler update equation. The posterior precision is simply the prior precision 
plus the likelihood precision, the observation precision. And the posterior mean is an update to the prior mean by a precision weighted prediction error. So this is your prediction error. Your observation y will differ by something from your prediction, simply your prior mean, mu theta. So this is your prediction error. You weight this prediction error in some sense, and you add it to your prediction, to your prior mean. And the way you weight it is by the observation precision divided by the posterior precision. This gives you your new mean. So you have a prediction, you have a prediction error, and you have a weight. And this weight you can interpret as a learning rate. And this makes sense on top of being correct and mathematically derived. It's also interpretable. It's a very nice feature of it. Because we can say how much we're learning here works in favor of the prediction error. And how much we already know is in the denominator, so it works against the prediction error. The more we already know, the less weight the prediction error has, the more precise our observation is, the more the prediction error counts. Yes? There's, in this little model, it's assumed to be known. So it is the precision of your measurement instrument, basically. But you can also simply make observations and infer it from your observations. We shall look at that in what is to come. So here we're basically looking at updates to the mean here and the precision of a Gaussian. If also the precision of your observations is unknown, you need a, more sli a slightly more complicated distribution, like a um, Gauss Gaussian gamma distribution. And you have to update more sufficient statistics in order to perform inference on that. But it is possible. Here we just assume that we know pi epsilon. Pi epsilon is a constant here, assumed known. But it can be inferred. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So the more information you have, the more precise your posterior will become. This is one of the fundamental problems that we're going to deal with. Because, I'm not going to give, no, I'm not going to give the because away yet. So um, I'll let you find the problem with this. There is a problem with this. Yes? The question is about why, is that? Pi. 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 We have two precisions. We have the precision in the likelihood, the pi epsilon, and the precision of the prior. So we here, have our prior here. The mean of the prior is mu theta. This will be the width of the prior is characterized by pi theta. So to be sure, what you get here is sort of the standard deviation. So it is the root of 1 over pi theta. So the larger pi theta is, the larger your precision is, 
the narrower your prior is. Now this is before we make an observation. Now we make an observation. The observation Y is, let's say, here. But the thing is, you can only make your observation with finite precision. Because you're, there will always be noise in any observation you make. So let's say your observation is quite precise. So you have a higher precision here. Then in your prior. Now here, the width of this Gaussian will be one over the square root of one over pi epsilon. It's basically the precision of your observation. And now you update this here by taking the difference here. This is the prediction error, y minus mu theta. It's positive because y is greater than mu theta. You use this prediction error to update mu theta. So you add to this to mu theta. Now, as we've seen, this is positive. This is a fraction of two positive quantities because they're precisions, they have to be positive. So we know that our posterior will be to, let's use blue, or maybe let's use yellow, better visible. So we know that our posterior will be to the right of the prior, which makes sense, because if your prior is here and your observation is here, you're going to want to adjust your belief in the direction of the observation. So. question for you. I'm going to give you two options, A and B. Which one is the more sensible one for the location of the posterior mean? Is it going to be, is mu, the updated mu theta given y? Is it going to be somewhere around A or is it going to be somewhere around B? Who, who, who votes for A? Okay, considerable number. Who votes for B? About equal, about equal. So, somebody who voted for A, give me a reason. Yes. As you can see from the equation, in our case, you've changed your mind to B. Yeah, because I mean, with the precision on the on the Y, I mean, on the likelihood is a bit confusing. Yes. So B is the correct answer. Can anybody? Just very, very simply. It just takes it. Perfect. Yes, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. That's how you can formulate this in a very few words. It's going to be closer to y if the observation was more precise than the prior. And it's going to be closer to mu theta if the prior was more precise than the observation. It's going to be exactly in the middle if they're equally precise. Let's just look at this. If these two are equal, then 
we're going to get exactly one half here. And this means we add one half of the prediction error to our prior, and we're, we end up in the middle. Now, in our case, we're going to be near here because we had a much more precise observation than a prior. Now, how precisely should I draw this one? Who would like it like this? Hands up. OK, at least one hand. I should give you an alternative before I ask. Who would prefer it more like this? Sorry, I didn't get that. No? Those are the two alternatives. I, one of them is more sensible than the other. So, so and always consider, I, I believe, um, you know, th these are Gaussians. Huh? I'm trying to draw Gaussians. All of them are supposed to be Gaussians. I'm just varying their precision. The sharper one, why? Because, yes? Exactly, exactly. We've made an observation, so our precision has increased. So the precision of the posterior is the sum of the precision of the prior and the likelihood. So this is it, the more precise one. Yes? Yes, exactly. We know more after making an observation, so I, our posterior will be more precise. So there are tricks, ways in which you can get broader distributions after making a new observation, but not in this simple, straightforward model. Simply making observations in, in this model and, and all of them like it increases your information. It increases the precision of your beliefs. This is a very fundamental example, and I'm glad we're discussing it in depth. So if you have any remaining questions about this, please ask. Yes? So it seems that each and every observation, the precision of each observation seems to be all not counted in the event of the limits of important accuracy. So whether or not a distribution of measurement is likely to be produced with much error or whatever, is that a well, okay, you have to account for, your, for the failings of your observations in your um, likelihood, in your observation model. So if you assume there may be a systematic error, then, I mean, if you don't have a way to assess your systematic error, all you can do is look at the variance of your measurements. But if you have a way to estimate your systematic error, then you should introduce a parameter into your likelihood describing systematic error and estimate that parameter with the other parameters in the model. So, for instance, you're looking at a time series with seasonal ups and downs. You're going to include a parameter for that. You, um, or you have a time lag. So, so you make an observation now and you believe um, this tells you something about the state of the world three months back. You introduce a parameter so for that. Your, so all your parameters represent everything that you know you know. Yes, yep. 
you do worry about it, and you worry about it in a very specific way, and we will also get to that. Yeah. Yes. What do you do with that? Well, that's your new prediction. Okay, and then you're considering if that's a new and then you make your next observation, yes. Yeah. So you use this sequentially to update your beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You can construct such models in, in various ways. So, so you can do um, Bayesian inference that doesn't, and uh, this is the first thing we'll look at. You can do Bayesian inference not just on your inputs, but also on the variance of your inputs. And then when you see that you've underestimated the variance of your inputs, you increase the width, at least of your predictive distribution. Yeah. So, but then you're, you, know, you use inference on this and inference on that. And then you use what you know about this to make predictions about that. We'll see that. We'll, we'll see how that works. Then another thing you can do is to violate the rules of Bayesian inference. So in this analogy between um, statistical mechanics and information theory, I didn't dwell on the point, but you may have noticed temperature was set to one. You always had internal energy minus temperature times entropy. And then when we went to information theory, temperature was gone. So effectively, it was set to one. Now, if you mess around with that, you're going to violate the rules of Bayesian inference, but you can get situations when you introduce um, a temperature lower than one, that gives you broader posterior distributions than prize you have. We're not going to do this here. Yes. 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 So um, then, if you know, if the your data generation model, you know, it, it, it implicitly in what you've said, you had a generative model of the data that we're fitting with this model, and if they don't match then this kind of inference will be inadequate. Inadequate, um, not appropriate. So you always want to have a model that corresponds to how data is really generated. So you were proposing to generate data using a process that is totally at variance with the likelihood that we assumed here. And then, of course, this model will fail. You will calculate some kind of mean, but as you already see, this doesn't work for the kind of data generation pro process that you assume to be underlying the data that you're fitting. So you should always, if you have reason to believe that a particular process is responsible for generating the data you have, then you should always use that as your model. And if you're not sure, you can always use model comparison to look at um, different possibilities for how these data could 
come about and what the best explanation for these data is. So we will look at um, some aspects of so some simple ways that we can use to compare different models. Because in general, you don't want to have just one model. You want to have several models that you can compare and, um, and see which one works best. Further questions? <coughs> Okay, then we'll just continue the little recap. So something we shall get to um, again in more detail is this can be generalized to all exponential families of distributions. We'll do this again, then just Basically, by way of um, letting you know, a hierarchical message passing system is assumed by the most advanced theories of cortical functioning to be responsible for the brain's predictions. The, how the brain updates its predictions is by these advanced theories of cortical functioning um, assumed to be a hierarchical message passing system where an error signal is passed upwards and a prediction signal is passed downwards. And then we changed tack. We said we're not going to calculate the posterior directly as we did here because we had a very simple model. We could just do the analytic calculation. We could just solve the integral in um, Bayes' theorem. And then we had an analytic solution for mu of theta given y and pi of theta given y. And that characterized our posterior. In most situations, this is not possible. And in almost all interesting situations, it's not possible. So we have to find clever ways around that, um, clever ways to calculate our posterior or to approximate our posterior in situations where we cannot find an analytic solution to it. One uh, that you've certainly heard of is sampling, and another here is to take another way at the problem and minimize surprise. So we looked at what surprise was, and surprise is just this. It is the probability of an event given a model M and you take the negative log of that. That's your surprise. An event that is certain is not surprising at all. Your surprise is zero. An event that is impossible under your model is, at least under that model, infinitely surprising. Then we looked at entropy. Entropy is the expectation value of surprise. So it's how much you expect to be surprised by what happens. So it's again the negative log probability of an observation and then the expectation value of that. And we looked at this with a coin toss example and we saw that the entropy was highest when the coin is fair, so when heads and tails are equally probable. And as soon as the coin is unfair, the entropy of the outcomes goes down because the outcomes are less surprising or you can, be, you can expect to be less surprised. So from an entropy of one, we go down to an entropy of, uh, for a fair coin, we go down to an entropy of 0 0.47 for a heavily unfair coin with a probability of heads 9 tenths and a probability of ta tails 1 tenth. So much for entropy. And then we started to look at free energy. And we distinguished thermodynamic free energy 
That's simply Helmholtz free energy, internal energy minus temperature times entropy. Then we went on to, we, we looked at um, free energy in statistical mechanics. And we saw this little comparison here, where you have the free energy in statistical mechanics and the free energy in information theory, which is simply the negative log model evidence. So this is the quantity in the denominator of Bayes' theorem. Let's look at this for a second because it's important. So in Bayes' theorem, you have your posterior probability on theta given observations y and model m is the likelihood probability of an observation y given parameters theta and the model m and your uh, priors on the yeah. parameters. And now in the denominator here, you've got your model evidence. This is called the model evidence. And this is the integral over this for all thetas. So here you have a specific theta. Now that I'm integrating theta out, I'm going to just call it theta prime. So this is... Given model. The model is always given. So, this is the evidence of this model. It is basically the probability of the data weighted by all possible values of the parameters, weighted by their prior, as you should see in the next equality. So, we integrate this here no oh, sorry theta prime theta prime so we integrate theta out that gives us this this is the sum rule of probability. And this is the product rule. Product rule says conditional times marginal gives you joint, and the sum rule means that if you marginalize over theta prime, then you get this marginal distribution just on the data. It's basically, given my model, including the prior on the parameters theta, how probable are the data? And now once we take the negative logarithm of that, as we do here, we have a surprise at the data. It's basically the free energy is how surprised is this model at seeing these data. Yes. Yes. Well, you could take the surprise here at this distribution, at this distribution. It is a particular kind of surprise. It's the surprise at the model, um, at the model evidence. Yeah. Yes. So, so, I mean, in general, surprise is um, 
the negative logarithm of a probability distribution. You can apply that to any probability distribution. The model evidence, or the log model evidence, is the surprise at the at this quantity here. But so the free, sorry, the free energy is the surprise at the model evidence. Okay. I hope that's when. Then, we did this trick where we took apart the model evidence, applying some algebra. We showed that this was the same as minus log P of Y given M. So this was on the slides before. Here. So we derived this. And then the problem was we couldn't calculate this because it contained the posterior. And that's exactly the problem we're trying to solve. We're trying to uh, get at the posterior. So now, very boldly, we just replaced the posterior that we didn't know with an arbitrary probability distribution, Q of theta. So now, instead of internal energy minus entropy, we have the variational energy. This, we're calling this the variational energy because it contains Q, and we're going to vary Q using variational calculus. And the variational entropy. And now it turns out that for whatever Q theta we choose, the variational free energy, AV, will be greater than or equal to the exact free energy, A. And this means we can wiggle around Q of theta and see what direction it goes. If it goes down, we know we're getting closer to the exact free energy. And in this way, we can approximate the exact free energy by varying the variational free energy without ever knowing the true value of A. We just know we're getting closer if AV goes down with the changes we make to Q. This is quickly the proof that AV is always greater, to, greater than or equal to A. And then there are three ways to decompose AV, and we didn't yet go into these. Um, before we do that, I think this is a good moment to have a quick break. Anybody not want to break? <laughs> want to be unpopular? Raise your hand. So we'll, move, we'll meet uh, back here in uh, a bit less than 10 minutes, huh? Seven, eight minutes. Uh, in, in, the, in the parameters, uh, yes. if you have a parameter that is not uh, related to, to the observation, 